introduction. <laughs> now I have no time to finish my talk. Okay, I would like to thank uh, Helena and Milton for the opportunity to be here and to, to visit for a long time in, in Rio. And I would like to thank also IMPA for hosting this conference and for hosting us during this semester. This was very special uh, semester. Okay, my talk sounds to be a little bit diverse from whatever is the topic about fluids. However, the topic is so general that I'm going to talk about. It's something computational. And fluids are not really far away from applications for this particular subject. I'm going to focus on ODEs, and it's since we are going to do computations, uh, eventually every PDE will be discretized and becomes an ODE, and therefore you can take it from here uh, applying the, the, the situation. The, the thing is about computing ODE systems in which you have slow and fast dynamics at the same time. In many cases, and I'm going to give some, something very elementary to introduce how do I get to the young measures. Traditionally, usually you have separation of scales. You know who's the fast guys and who's the slow guys, and therefore there is a classical theory about how to compute the slow guys basically by inputting the effect of the fast guys into the motion. And that's what basically we will be doing in averaging techniques and so on and so forth. However, the systems I'm going to deal with is basically that the equations and every variable in the equation, every unknown, has both at the same time fast features and slow features. And therefore, we cannot separate scales. The question, can we still develop numerical algorithms for computing slow features of the system, not slow variables. Because I don't know if there are slow variables. I don't know even if there is a function or change of variables which can separate the system into slow and fast. I'm going to talk about slow features. And what are these slow features? They are observables on the system, which are basically could be slow. And maybe this I would like to, to talk about. Now, I don't know if I will be able to get the full details because when it comes to the details, I'm going to go a little bit fast. But I would like to give you the metaphor so you would understand where this is coming from. In fluid mechanics, the like Schneider, Stokes, and Euler, usually one way to derive the equations, we have here the word experts sitting among us, Claude, is about Boltzmann equations. Boltzmann equations are about molecules. And these molecules are going like crazy all over the place. And now you cannot separate which one of these molecules is the slow guy and which is the fast guy. Okay? On the other hand, if you look from far away, you see that there's some cloud of events happening which is moving relatively to the vibration of all this, moving with certain, certain uh, motion. We would like to extract that. We would like to identify this kind of like slow motion and try to compute it. What happens in Boltzmann is you divorce yourself completely from the world of the particles where they live, and you move to a different world, the world of measures, which are invariant measures for the motion of these particles. Now, oh, maybe the particles themselves are very fast, but maybe the measures or the distribution are slow. Maybe not. However, what he says, well, maybe the whole measure is not really moving slowly, but let's look to the moments of the measure. And maybe some of the moments are slow and some are fast. We don't know. What happens in the context of Boltzmann equations is indeed the zero moment, the first moment, and the second moment happen to be slow and happen usually to close. Namely, usually when you take the first moment, it's coupled to the second and third and other moments. And, the, and therefore, if you continue, you have infinite chain of moments. You cannot close it. What happens in the case of Boltzmann, you get closed, and at the limit, a certain parameter goes to zero, which is the station, you recover the Euler Navier stocks. So this is a success story. The question, can we learn from this success story and try to move into systems like that. And therefore, you can see now where I'm heading. I'm going to head basically into, because I don't have separation of scales, which is fast and which is slow, I should divorce myself from the world of where the variables are taking place into another world of observables on this system. And maybe there I can identify certain slow features, which I probably can design 
techniques, numerical techniques for computing them. This is the picture at large, and now let's basically start rolling and uh, see the, the details, which is, I'm gonna go skip over them. I'm gonna go a little bit, oh, that's me now. <clears throat> Okay, so let's uh, go through the, <coughs> what happens here? Yeah, <laughs> I already, so I already discovered the first feature, which is slow. It just was working a minute ago. No, very invariant. St 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 it's steady. Yeah, but I don't know. This is advances. Yes, it does. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so here's the outline. I'm going to talk about classical theory of uh, the uh, the uh, Yapunov uh, Tikhonov uh, uh, theory. Uh, motivating examples of the limit cycle because I'm going to slowly move from something simple where I have steady states and everything is nice and beautiful, then bifurcate into situation where I have limit cycles, and then I'm going to bifurcate into when I have strange attractors and see what's going to happen because I would like to slowly introduce where does, how does this young measure pop up naturally in this particular situation. So then I'm going to move to the use of young uh, measures, and young measures will be description of the limit of the fast dynamics. Because in most classical theory of single perturbation, everybody tells you what happens to the slow dynamics when you have separation variables. But nobody tells you what is the limit of the fast dynamics. People say, oh, we don't care. Well, no, suppose I care. What happens? They, they don't know. So this is basically is going to be using the young measure to describe this particular feature. Then I'm going to talk about fast slow system without separation of state variables, computing the slow variables observable. So here is a classical system in which basically I start from what I said I want to avoid. Namely, I'm going to start with the case where I have separation of variables. So you have dx dt equals f of xy and epsilon. This is the fast dynamics. This is the slow dynamics. So what happens in these features? Usually you look formally what happens when epsilon equal to zero. You get algebraic equation g of xy equals to zero, which is solved algebraically y as function of x, and usually you take this y and plug it into here. This is nice, and let me basically tell you what did I mean here. I basically look at g of xy equals to zero. I get a surface. Say so this is x, this is y, this, this is the solution. And then what happens is the following, that when epsilon is very, very, very small, then you get dy dt is 1 over epsilon. Therefore, the y variable is moving very quickly. By the time the x is about to change, the y is already going very quickly. So if you look only at the fast dynamics, when x is fixed, so x is fixed, because it's hardly moving, and look to the fast dynamics, you have to look for the dy dt equals a g of xy when this is equal, when x is fixed. Therefore, you have to look what happens to the fixed point. So the question, is this fixed point stable for the fast dynamics or not? If it is stable, then I converge very quickly here, and then the y is going very quickly here, and by the time we get very quickly, the x start moving slowly, and therefore, because all the time this manifold g of xy is a stable fixed point for the fast dynamics, then the dynamics is very simply uh, motivated by replacing this and solve y as function of x, plug it into the first equation and get whatever needed to get. And this is basically the classical theory of Tikhonov, Tikhonov uh, situation. So the computing the solution above system is very costly, especially when epsilon equal to zero, for very small. Uh, this is because we need to basically take time step delta t is like epsilon. Our goal becomes is find a limit behavior of solution when y x epsilon y epsilon go to zero. Moreover, what is the equation of motion governs this limit behavior? That's basically our goal. And can we develop efficient numerical algorithms for computing the above limit behavior? That's, these are basically 
our goals. And I basically started talking in the situation when I have this scenario. So as I said, the classical theory of singular perturbation system employs order reduction method. So what you solve the differential equation epsilon equal to zero, you get algebraic equation, exactly what I mentioned here. And then you solve this algebraic equation and you plug back. However, the classical Levinson-Tikhonov approach assumes the following condition, which is I just described. This, the region where the analysis is carried out, where we are interested, when x is fixed, the solutions of the fast equation, the y ds equals g of xy, the solution of the fixed points are stable. Because if they are stable, then I converge to, oops. When they are stable, I converge very quickly to here, and therefore the, I, can, I can solve the algebraic equation y function of x and plug it into the slow dynamics and to get the situation. So here is, let's consider the following simple example. I, got, I get the, uh, the, this is the slow dynamics, it's two-dimensional, and this is the fast dynamics, it's two-dimensional. There is a potential here, F, and F, I'm going to give you two examples of F, which is, will basically tell us what's happening. So the two Fs I'm going to take into account are, uh, and I would like to compute what has it as epsilon goes to zero. I'm going to get two cases of F, Fs and Fu, which is Fs is the stable case, and this is the unstable case, and the difference between them is just the sign between minus eta and plus eta. Everything else is exactly the same. This is the situation. So in the case of the stable situation, it confirms the classical single perturbation, and therefore the assumptions of the uh, Levinson-Tikhonov works, and as a result, if you look to the slow variables, is kept fixed, the fast dynamics is converging very quickly to the fixed point, which is the first position is minus 6c1, minus 6c2, and zero. And therefore, when you take this and plug it into the equation, then the dynamics is described in this particular situation. The slow, the, the, the fast dynamics is slaved to the slow dynamics by this algebraic relation, and so on and so forth. And as a result, we get this reduced system where I replaced exactly the eta 2 by, by the eta 1 by the difference between xi 1 and xi 2, and the eta 2 by 0, and therefore this is the situation. This is the classical situation. Now, suppose this scenario is not valid. <coughs> suppose this fixed point is not stable. Then even when I'm starting very close to it, I'm going to be kicked away from it. And therefore, Solving this algebraic relation and saying that the fast dynamic is function of the slow dynamics doesn't make sense because the fast dynamics takes me away from this manifold. And therefore, re solving this reduction and plugging it back is really does not hold. Now, what happens in this case? So let's take a simple example. Imagine that for every fixed x, so if I look at the y plane, which is like, say, two-dimensional, fixed x, this is the fixed point. This is the y1 and y2, if you like. Imagine that I'm in a scenario where I have a limit cycle, but like I have like poincare bindixon situation. This is unstable, and therefore you go into a limit cycle. So what is stable is the limit cycle. What happens in this situation? Just going, building up the situation, or building up the case. In this particular situation, Okay, so now let's take in the unstable case. In this case, uh, this particular example that I said, it is uh, really an example which is coming in mechanical system, which has been introduced by Arstein and Slimrod and by these uh, uh, nice people in some mechanical system. Uh, so the, as I said, the Levison-Tikhonov theory in this case does not apply. And indeed, when, it, when the, the variables, the, basically the slow variables, Kept, uh, is kept fixed fast dynamics, one gets basically a van der Poel type equation, and the van der Poel type equation for fixed x, this is exactly where the poincare bindixon theory happens that the limit cycle is the stable and not the fixed point. So what happens in this situation? So let me work under the following assumptions. Assume that basically for fixed c1 and c2 and with initial data eta1, a different fixed point, the fast solution converges to a limit cycle. I would like to see what happens under this assumption, which is exactly for this particular situation. Namely, that the limit, the fast dynamics has a limit cycle limit, 
which is as, 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 as time goes to infinity, or basically even for epsilon small, for short time, you immediately converge to, to there. And I would like to see. Now, this limit cycle is for every fixed x. A limit cycle is a curve, which is I'm going to denote it by gamma x. So this kind of work has been introduced or basically studied in classical textbook, Bagolyobov and uh, Mitropolsky, as well as Ponteryagin, and so on and so forth. So some computations that we did with Linschitz uh, and Artstein, Linschitz, uh, the same Linschitz that we mentioned in different work by, with Bardos, basically shows that for different epsilon, in the case of stable, if you do direct numerical simulation to converge or to get something reasonable, you see when it's stable, basically it doesn't matter for small virus epsilon, you can really converge and settle into right answer within very fast time. But in the unstable case, you have really to solve for delta t very, very small, and therefore it takes longer and longer time in order to basically get something reasonable when epsilon is very small. And this is indicates that you need to find alternative approach to the whole situation. So we work under the situation, the assumption that the limit cycle is, uh, is, is stable. So in this region, that for every fixed x, the initial condition y, the solution of the fast dynamics is converging to a limit cycle. Now, how can we describe a limit cycle? There are different ways to dis describe a limit cycle. Limit cycle is nothing but a curve which is periodic, with period t which depends on x, because for every x fixed, I have a different limit cycle for every limit x. So in this picture that I have here in the, in the, in the wall, in the, in the blackboard, in the y direction, I converge to a limit cycle this. For different x, I have a different limit cycle. For different x, I have a limit different cycle. And therefore, what happens is the fast dynamics will converge to the limit cycle, but the slow dynamics will start moving slowly. And therefore, basically, I have a coil wrapped all along. And that's the, 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 the whole dynamics of the whole equation is like that. I don't want to see the whole coil because it's too complicated. I would like to see some only how does the center, how does the x is evolving slowly. Can I really find the features of that without really computing all the coil that, that, that needed? That's basically the idea. So the limit cycles is basically can be parameterized by curves. Another way to parameterize a limit cycle is basically by a measure. How so by a measure? Because I can tell you on this limit cycle, because it's coming from dynamics, how much time I spend on each arc by probability, which is basically, it is intertwined with the other parameterization. So the distribution mu, which is the probability distribution, it is, if you want to think, it's a delta supported on the, delta measure supported on the, on the, on the, on the curve. But different points on the limit cycle has different weight, or if actually different arcs have different weight, depends, because maybe on the limit cycle, sometimes I zip very quickly, and sometimes I'm going very slowly. And this is the measure which describes the dynamics on this particular, uh, particular, particular curve. So now I'm moving from basically describing it by a curve or by a function by a measure. Okay? And this is, in some sense, the introduction, the, most, the first non-trivial, in some sense, Young measure. For every x, it's a measure value, which is a curve. So you think about a function or a curve as a delta measure, which is supported on this particular curve. So this is a, this is an example of a young measure. Let's forget about this picture. So I said there is a relationship between the two measures. And what is it? So if you give me an arc, an arc, the measure of this arc is basically the Lebesgue measure in time of how much time I do spend at this particular arc. This is basically the relationship between the gamma parameterization as a function and the, the measure. So for any measurable subset and for every lambda the measure on the real line, that's basically the relation between the two. So notice that for every fixed x, the measure mu x is invariant measure for the fast dynamics because I settle quickly to the limit cycle. So if I'm in the limit cycle, I remain on the limit cycle and it's an invariant measure. So this approach was investigated by Arstein and by Arstein and Vigodner. So denote by x epsilon, y epsilon, the solution of the system, when, depending on epsilon, and I'm assuming that they have a limit cycle which is converging. So the goal is to describe the structure of the limit as x epsilon, y epsilon converge to zero, as epsilon goes to zero on certain finite interval of time. That's what I would like to describe. So when we're referring to the limit cycle giving above, using the periodic solution distributions, 
We also need to converge. No, we need also convergence notion of probability measure, which is basically conversion in weak sense, and I will use this in, 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 in a minute. So here's the theorem. Under the assumption that LC, the slow part x epsilon of the solution, converges as epsilon goes to zero uniformly to some function x zero, and this x zero is usually satisfying this evolution equation. This is nothing but the classical averaging lemma. That's basically what is done. This is the classical averaging lemma that you take the fast dynamics, you replace it by this curve, and you average with respect to S, and therefore you get the vector field which is tells you how slow you are advancing in, 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 in X. So X0 is satisfying this equation, and X0 is the limit of X goes to, as, as epsilon goes to zero. This is the, the, the situation. A different way to think about it, aha, because this measure, the Lebesgue measure, and this mu measure are the same, notice uh, uh, Charlie, that now I integrate with respect to the measure mu x dy, but I take dy over the whole space. So, the, my, one, so most of the, all the space has measure zero. It's a delta on the curve. But this is nonetheless this, and this are exactly the same. And this is, gives you the equation of motion of the slow feature, which is in this case is the slow variable. Uh, so this, again, I said, this is, has been presented in, in, in the averaging techniques, this particular situation, which is just there is nothing really much between these two. This is the same representation, but now we are moving into a new point of view, into like basically thinking about these curves as delta measures or as measures supported on these particular curves. So now, the limit structure of the fast part, what happens? I told you what happens with x epsilon, with the slow variable. What happens with the fast variable? This is a little bit more delicate. So we said x0 is we know that it is a function, but y epsilon, as you see, what's y epsilon? It's the fast dynamics in the mid-cycle. You don't expect it to converge to a function because it's going very split. Like y epsilon as a function of epsilon is like, like, sine, like something like sine of t over epsilon. It's relating like crazy. You don't expect it to converge to a function, and therefore we cannot describe it by a function. And that's this is the whole new point of view. What one can hope is to identify the limit topologically, as I said, as a coil. When x is moving slowly, then the y epsilon is wrapping, wrapping, wrapping. At the limit, you get basically a tube. So the limit of x epsilon, y epsilon topologically is a tube. x is basically the center of the tube, if you want, and the y is basically the, the, the boundary of the tube. So topologically, this is one way to see it. So topologically, this is the description as x epsilon y epsilon converging to the set, which set x0 of t, which is, I know it's dynamics, and gamma of x0. So for every x0, there is a limit cycle for every x0. So topologically, it's a union of circles, which is topologically, it's a tube. Okay? And we know that x, x0 is the limit as, uh, as is. This is, if you want to think topologically, geometrically, this is the picture. But we would like to do analysis. I would like to do numerical analysis. How can I describe this analytically? So in a quantitative way, because I look at mu epsilon to be the measure, I know that basically as epsilon goes to zero, these delta measures supported on the limit cycles, as, or these measures in mu, I can think about their limit as measures. Now, if you give me a function, sequence of functions, the limit of sequence of functions need not to be a function. But if you give me a sequence of functions, but then I view them as graphs, namely they are delta measures on the support on the graph, there is a hope that the limit of the measures to make sense. And that's basically the whole new approach, is to think about the limit of the y epsilon not as functions because they don't converge as functions, but because they are equivalent to delta measures on the graphs of these functions that we look for their, for their limit. And indeed, so the fast dynamics is basically described by a measure, mu, which is with the index x0, this is basically the center, the center of it. So describe it as a young, young measure. And now, as I said, so you think about x epsilon, y epsilon, because they are functions, the equivalent description is delta measures at these points. And as the limit, as epsilon goes to zero, I see what is the limit of these measures as epsilon goes to zero. Y epsilon does not converge as a function, but the whole thing as a measure 
as you hope to converge. And indeed, this is will converge to the product of the two measures. So this is the example that here is a nice sequence of function which is very oscillatory. The limit does not make sense as functions, but as a measure, it will make, make, uh, make, make sense. So useful representation in our case, in terms of uh, convergence distribution, probability image intuitive uh, flavor. So as I say, the y epsilon will converge in the sense of measure to this uh, limit cycle. So here is the, I'm going to give you some computations with the uh, Lynchitz and, uh, and RC in the case of unstable situation. So the fast dynamics is very quickly converging. This is just the fast dynamics converging quickly to a limit cycle. This is the slow dynamics, how it's really slowly is really evolving. Only the slow dynamics, how is it really evolving? If I would like to put everything together, you get a zoo. You see all these kind of coils wandering around because the center of the coil is really going like that. This is the center of the coil. And around each one of these coils have fast limit cycles are going around. And that's why the full dynamics is really a crazy situation like that. But one way to, to understand it is basically a measure. So <clears throat> another example which is really artificial but to show you the situation, this is, looks complicated, but if you move into the right coordinates, into polar coordinates, you get basically this is the slow dynamics and this is the complete picture. You can see these kind of coils or basically this kind of tube which is like becoming smaller and bigger depending on the cellular cycles are growing and, and shrinking depending on the situation. Okay, so what happens if you have general fast dynamics? Well, if you have general fast dynamics, we have now a supposition to make. Does this picture different from what I said before? No. In case the fixed point is stable, the invariant measure is the delta at the fixed point because everything converging to it, and this is the invariant measure of the fast dynamics. In case the limit cycle is stable, then the invariant measure of the limit cycle, the delta function limit cycle does the job. Suppose now for every x, I have a y system, three-dimensional, which is a Lorentz system. It's not a limit cycle. And suppose you converge to this Lorentz system. And suppose that the parameters of this Lorentz system is exactly the x variables. So for, you converge very quickly to the Lorentz system, the fast dynamics, but then after you settle there, X start moving, so you move from one Lorentz system to the next Lorentz system, to the, so you have chaotic dynamics next to chaotic dynamics next to, the question, can I find the evolution of the parameters, the features? And the way to think about it, look to the invariant measures of the Lorentz system, and then find the average of the parameters, the mu with respect to them, and then you have the equation of advancement for them. This is basically the big picture, but there should be mathematically an underlying assumption. And what's the underlying assumption? You look to the fast dynamics, the domain of interest compact attractor with unique invariant measure. Unique invariant measure. This is a big assumption. Okay? And here is a word of warning. Okay? We cannot guarantee existence of unique invariant measure. You assume it, then you have theorem. That's what we do in mathematics. You assume so and so and so, we get so and so and so. You can check the assumptions, sometimes work, sometimes do not work. In general, if you give me any system, checking this situation is not possible that you have unique invariant measure. And now I would like to tell you what happens in practice. There are basically two communities, deterministic, like me, stochastic, like many other people, okay? And everybody's doing fast and slow, but everybody doing stochastic. Very few people doing deterministic. Why? I can tell you the secret. The secret is you add into this fast dynamics small noise, then you guarantee a unique invariant ergodic measure, and now you can continue the same way. That's the only reason you need stochastic stuff. Without this stochastic stuff, you cannot guarantee uniqueness of invariant measure, and therefore the rest of the program cannot continue. That's the secret. You add small noise, you guarantee unique invariant measure, and now you can continue. Okay? This is as far as I'm concerned, black on white, as far as the difference between the two communities as far as the theory is con 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 continuing. Now, what can happen if you don't have unique invariant measure? I will tell you about a proposal and we will see what's going to happen. So what happens here? So here's the theorem. If you have unique invariant measure, the x epsilon will converge to some x0, to a function, and this function is basically given by the average of this invariant measure of the fast dynamics, which is, I assume, it is unique. And now what happens with the fast dynamics? The fast dynamics is basically, as I said, it's the Dirac, me the Dirac measure in, in, on delta, 
and at the limit is converging into the mu of x0. So the limit of the fast dynamics is a measure in this particular situation. <laughs> now, here's the proposal. What happens if you don't have a unique measure here? Maybe I have many measures. And therefore, the average of the right-hand side is not unique. It will be a set. And therefore, the x dt will belong to a set. And this is a field of mathematics <coughs> called inclusion equations. And now we need to develop techniques of numerical analysis of inclusion equations. What happens if you have many invariant measures and you take all the averages and can you progress because different features will follow different ones and this is basically the proposal what to be done later. Now if you have this set of, of, of situations, set of many invariant measures, you add the noise, what it does noise, the noise what, all what the noise does is basically keep you jumping from one measure to the other. It averages over all the measures together to give you a unique ergodic measure and that's basically you don't need this scenario. So this is a proposal of what's happening here. How much time do I have still? <coughs> 15 minutes? Okay, very good. All right, so this is basically now give you the, me the situation why this young measure is a natural or extension for this situation because then you have basically the, 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 the first. But this is again in the, under the assumption that I told you I would like to avoid, namely I have separation of scales. I have fast and slow. But nonetheless, it is inspirational. So in many interesting application, one does not have separation of scales. The state variables. Therefore, one might have to identify slow functionals or observables of the state variables and find efficient algorithm, efficient algorithm to compute them. That's basically now my program. Suppose I don't have the separation of variables. What can one do? So we have to maybe settle for less than the variables themselves, but to look for functionals or some observables on the state variables. So I'm going to look into fast and slow dynamics, but not fast and slow state variables. So I'm going to look into a particular case. Again, this case is extension of the previous case. I'm going to look into an equation of the type the ud tau, 1 over epsilon f of u, g of u. Namely, the vector field has two components, a fast component and a slow component. So therefore, every component in U is advected by the fast and at the same time is advected by the slow. And the question is what can be done in this situation? Notice I said this is a simple generalization of the previous scenario. Why is simple generalization of the previous scenario? Because in the previous scenario, in fact, you can think about F to be 0 and g of x, y. This is the f. And what's about the g? It is the f of x, y and 0. If you take this particular situation, I'm back into the previous scenario. U is two components, x and y, fast and slow. But now, I'm basically generalizing that I'm allowing to have fast component in the x part and slow component in the and now the question, what can be done in this situation? So it's very simple, particular example. I'm not solving all the situations, but this is simple extension. I would like to deal with it. So this is joint work with the Artstein and Kiverkidis and Slimrod. So let's the initial data, u0, b, as above equation, be given. And suppose t is given and fixed. So I look to u epsilon to be the solution of the above equation for a given epsilon in the interval 0 t. Now, what we can guarantee is that there exists a subsequence that converging. But there is no way on earth that I can guarantee you that this u epsilon to converge to a function. I already learned the example because u is the x epsilon and y epsilon. And we know that the y epsilon does not go to 0, it should go to a measure. Therefore, you should give up already at this stage to hope for the limit of the u epsilon to converge into a function, and therefore we learn from the previous situation that maybe it should converge into a measure. And of course, I cannot guarantee the uniqueness of the limit, therefore there are subsequences converging, because I don't know that the measure is unique, and therefore I don't know the whole sequence is converging. So it will converge to a measure, to a young measure, and this particular young measure is invariant for the fast dynamics. This is the issue. So the young measure that I converge into it, it's exactly an invariant measure for only for the fast component alone. So this is the simple generalization as before, but I know that u will not converge to a function, u converges to a measure. Now what? Here's the question. 
Can one still identify some slow features of the above system? Not state variables, but features. From experience uh, with other physical systems, in search need not to be limited to identifying slow components or slow state variables which might not even exist. As I said, the example of Boltzmann, you don't expect any of the particles to be slow, whatever, or even combination of them or even function of them. However, if you look for functionals of them, like the integral, like the, the moments, the first moment, and so on and so with respect to the measures, then you can get something which is nice, and these are basically the the density, the velocity, and the energy in the Navier-Stokes and Euler equation. So can we develop efficient numerical algorithms to compute these particular features? So if you look into my equation, I want to something which is a feature which is a slow. So, and I said it should not be a state variable. And this is very simple observation. We do not find all of them, but this is very simple observation. Let me look at this equation. So the system is du, the tau, 1 over epsilon f of u plus g of u. This is the bad guy, which is basically make things going fast. I would like to find a feature which is in some sense is indifferent for this guy. So let me look at this equation, ds dt of u equals f of u. Suppose I look for constants of motion, namely a functionals which are not moving at all, like the energy of the system, which is like if, it's if it is conservative or something like that, or some moments, quantities which are not really moving at all. So if I take such a quantity i of u, let's say, a constant of motion of the fast variable, therefore the du, the ta, the, when you take the time derivative of this, and when you plug it inside here, it will not be affected by f because it's supposed to be constant by f. So you don't see the fast dynamics. u will be fast, but i of u will be not moving, dead. And now all what we need to see, how is it drifted by the slow dynamic because it's not constant of motion of the slow dynamics. So these are some of the features that I can identify for the particular, for this particular system. Find if they exist. If, I've, if they exist, then I find some of those features and the question how we do it. And that's what happens in Boltzmann. You don't look for all the constants of motion. You find for some kind of like moments, three moments and they happen to be close and we happen to be happy. And there's Euler and Navier Stokes which keep all of us here, at least in this room, are busy and put bread on our table because of just basically three equations, if you want, coming from three moments coming from Boltzmann equation. So as I said, so let us look into the constant of motion of the fast dynamics. And uh, I take this, I'll call them the slow observables. And uh, the idea is then to find the equations of motion of the way they are drifted by the slow dynamics. So if I call them in u of u, in u of u, these are basically the constant of motion, then I would like to see the equation of motion of them. So therefore, this derivative is equal to zero. That's exactly what I wrote here. I called them i, then I called them u for the fast dynamics. But now I'd like to see how they are drifted. So they are how they are drifted by this particular situation. So they are observed that they are also living in the support of the invariant measure mu of the fast dynamics. I'm not going to get into the details. I'm going to give you the closed formula and then tell you how efficiently we compute. So the formula is the following. So this constant of motion, the evolution of them, how is it drifted by the slow dynamics? You take the gradient. This is because you go in the direction, basically the directional derivative in the direction of G. So you take the gradient of these functions multiplied by G. In other words, I need to know in advance the analytic formula of V as fast as the constant of motion of the fast dynamics, like the energy, the moments, Hamiltonian, if you have Hamiltonian system, all the Casimirs in Hamiltonian systems, they are all, all where I have explicit formula for them. Then I take this analytic formula multiplied by G. G is given, so all this quantity is given to me. Aha! Then you average it with respect to the fast dynamics, and this gives you the vector field or the direction how they're going to progress for the next level. So imagine that you have a quick dynamics. The best way to view it is that 
this is the level surface of one of those functions in U for the fast dynamics. Namely, it is not moving. It's a level surface because they are constant of motion. So therefore, the fast dynamics is living here. And for the fast dynamics, this quantity does not move. But then the G will drift you to the next leaf and then the next leaf and the next leaf. So the fast dynamics will keep like this. This is basically the crazy stuff, but I'm going to tell you how I'm going to move slowly from one leaf to the next to the next. This is the equivalent of the X0, which is slowly moving. It's like, how do these leaves moving from one to the other? What's the algorithm now that I have the vector field? How do I do it? On each leaf, I sample the fast measure, and then I need to solve that. Therefore, I know the right-hand side in the average. Now, to move from one leaf to another, this is a slow dynamics. I can take delta t large. And therefore, I jump to the next leaf. Then I do the fast dynamics. I sample it. Then I jump to the next leaf. I sample it. Jump in, and that's where the, efficiently, the efficiency coming in the algorithm. Instead of computing and computing and computing with delta t like epsilon, you have to compute a lot. But then you gain, after you sample the measure, to jump. And then you gain to jump, and so on and so forth. This is basically the algorithm and the idea. doesn't solve all of them. For example, as I said, if the fast dynamics is Hamiltonian, it has Casimirs drifted by some kind of dissipation or by some other quantity, that's the situation. I'm going to give you one example in which uh, we do it just very quickly. Five minutes? Very good. Thank you. So here's an example which is I'm going to take. This is a system of ODEs. The UK dt equals to this quantity and this quantity. For those who really have some experience or taught some course in numerical analysis, it's easy to see. This is the discrete Laplacian, okay, because it was a continuum. And this is almost like U, U, X. So this is viscous burgers, okay? So this is the discrete version of viscous burgers. If you take any course in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in numerical analysis, the first thing they teach you is don't discretize burgers this way, okay? But why I do it? Because I'm following Goodman and Lacks, because they discretize it this way to show you why this discretization has maybe not much to do with Burger's equation, but has some other features which has happened to be nice, okay? So I'm going to look at these particular equations, which is discretization of Burger's. This is U, U, X, and this is the Laplace, okay? And the epsilon is like the viscosity. Well, divide by epsilon, risk kill the time. It's like the viscosity. So this is the fast dynamics. It's like exactly coming to here. So this is the fast dynamics, and this is the slow dynamics. Okay. So as I said, this is some discretization of this. This is basically was uh, investigated by Goodman and Lacks. And uh, what's interesting about this particular discretization, when I look to the fast dynamics alone, the UDT equals 1 over epsilon F, this system of ODEs, it happened to be an integrable system. Something completely different than what I was doing here. It happens to be integrable system. Integrable system means it has lots and lots of constants of motion which are independent of each other. And therefore, I have lots of these I's or in use. Basically, that I can integrate a lot of slow features that I can integrate, even though the system is very... So we chose this system to demonstrate the power of the machine, that not only one quantity or two quantities. I have, if you have like system which is like have 100 Equations, I have 50 constants of motion that I can, or 50 slow features that I can compute. So we took this just particularly to demonstrate the situation because it is an integrable system, even though it is not the right way to discretize it from the numerical analysis of conservation loss point of view. So it is an integrable system. There's a lot of, uh, so the computation has been done with Artstein, Gear, uh, Keverkidis, Lemroad. And this is uh, the fast dynamics. You can see that it's converging to some kind of like tori. This is the fast dynamics. You can see the first component, like you can see, is very oscillating. And now, if you look to this quantity, which is I'm supposed to advance, at every moment, a moment is oscillating. But I don't need to take it like that. I have to average it. And now when you average it, you see it settles down to be a number. And therefore, I can take a big jump with it. So this shows you that the average of this quantity is indeed slow feature that basically progressing. And now, this is the dynamics of the slow feature. We take for a long, 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 long time. You can basically, this is the slow features or the constants of motion of this integrable system that three of them, at least, we can really compute. And this is showing you that if you integrate for a long time, you converge to this tori, then these tori start shrinking because of the viscosity, and they're becoming very chaotic, very dense tori because, you know, these kind of wrapping, wrapping, wrapping very quickly, but their size, topologically, they are shrinking, 
And on the other hand, from these pictures, maybe you don't see much, but from this picture, you can see that certain quantities are really moving slowly, and that's all what I need for this thing. And thank you very much for your attention. Yes, sir.